City Steakhouse, a true neighborhood restaurant operated by the Voikovich family since 1934, is the oldest steakhouse in the city of New Orleans. Serving only hand-cut, prime-age, corn-fed beef for over 80 years, Crescent City Steakhouse has become a dining destination for both die-hard locals and adventurous travelers who seek traditional, timeless New Orleans cuisine. Crescent City Steakhouse, 1001 North Broad, on the corner of St. Philip, in the heart of New Orleans. Fall in love with autumn with PJ's new seasonal lattes. Our pumpkin latte brings you all the flavors of a pumpkin pie with hints of cinnamon and nutmeg, like your favorite holiday dessert in a cup. And our s'mores latte with flavors of toasted marshmallows, warm milk chocolate, and graham cracker cinnamon is sure to bring back campfire memories. The PJ's Fall Seasonal Lattes, available at your local PJ's only for a limited time. So here's the bottom line. Good evening and welcome to Primetime Sports. I'm your host Scott Alexander and out of the 125 or so shows that we've already done, this may be the most unique we've ever had. So stay tuned. It's going to be a fun one and I cannot wait once again. Hey, there's so much to talk about right now in the open. Uh, let's start with the Saints OTAs. They're going into their third week right now. Uh, last Thursday we went over and visited with some of the players, talked to Sean Payton, had a great conversation with Marshawn Lattimore. There's Ben Watson right there. It's so good to have him back in the locker room. Lattimore and, of course, Nate Stupar is always fun to talk to. And, by the way, fans, you can get out there. Hey, don't forget, just the next week, it's going to be from June 12th through the 14th, from 11 o'clock to about 1.30 or so. The fans can come out each and every day. Get on out and watch your Saints and see what they may have coming before they start training camp next month. Hey, don't forget the NBA Finals, as you know, they're in full swing right now. It's, it's the same thing it's been for the last four years. It's the same two teams, first time ever, the Cavs against the Warriors. And the Cavs route to get there has been remarkable. It's amazing that they're in there and they almost stole game one. They were 13 point underdogs and they had the lead most of the way against Golden State. LeBron had 51 points. But then a thing happened at the end of the game. There it is. You see it. We've talked about it a lot around the news world. And there he is. J.R. Smith lost track of the time. And then in game two, well, Curry and Durant were special like they usually are. Curry with 33 points in NBA record finals, nine threes in that. And also Kevin Durant had 26. Those two are playing well. Hey, how about the hockey, though? The NHL finals. The Knights won game one. But look at the... Washington Capitals, they won game two, and I have to say this, they're up three to one now, but if it not for Braden Holpe's amazing stick save in game two in Las Vegas, and it was amazing. He stuck the puck. You see the puck? That's an open shot. That should always go in. He stuck that stick out right in the right place, and they won that game, and now they won the last two games that have been in D.C., including last night, six to two. They are up three to one in the series. Here's the thing. Normally, in the Stanley Cup Finals, only one out of like 35 times has a team been up 3-1 and not won. But in the playoffs in the Capitals history, they've let that happen five times in the playoffs in their history where they've been up 3-1 and blown it. 58% they win those kind of series where the rest of the league is at 93%. So you can't say anything's for sure yet. Hey, LSU baseball fans, it's been a rough year. But you know what? By most school standards, it's been just fine. LSU lost so much talent. But they'll be back. They got knocked out bad by Oregon State. Let's hope they don't lose two sophomores, Zach Watson and Zach Hess. Because they're 21, they are eligible for the draft, even though they've only been at LSU two years. How about a big thumbs up for Travis Swaggerty? He is from Mandeville, been playing his high school ball in Denver Springs because of Katrina. He was in the 10th round. He was picked. I mean, 10th pick, overall pick. He was picked by the Pirates. Congrats to him. The French Open's in full swing. And how about the Belmont this weekend? That's going to be justified going for the Triple Crown. And I have to mention this. Dwight Clark passed away at the age of 61. Known for the famous catch, called the catch, 
from Joe Montana. He is an incredible human being. That play ended the Cowboys' great dynasty and began the Niners. And Dwight Clark and Joe Montana are owners of five Super Bowl rings. Hey, we'll be back right next. We've got a great show right here on Primetime Sports. Stay tuned. Sleeping like a dead dog when a daddy came to say, Get yourself a hammer song, it's a demolition day. Walking in the backyard with a cock 22. Mama's in the attic and the hatchet and the high water blues. Hey, we saw the tears come down. Daughter, when she got the. Welcome back to Primetime Sports. And I told you we're going to mix this show up a little bit. You know, we had Archie Manning, Zach Streif, Alvin Gentry. Those are former Saints and obviously the Pelicans coach. But right now we're going to talk another sport that's loved in the city. It's soccer. And our professional team here is the New Orleans Jesters. You know, I've had Kenny Farrell, the head coach, a few times. But for the first time ever, we've got a couple of his players. We have a guy from Metairie who played at Rummel and a guy from, well, it's not Metairie. It's across the pond. It's England from Southampton. His name is Mason Walsh. And the, the Rummel guy, well, his name is Adam Torres. And here they are from the Jester squad. What's up, buddy? Yeah, pleasure meeting you. Nice to see you. How you I doing, did. Mason? Yeah, good, thank you. And if you couldn't tell, Mason's the one from England, <laughs> and Adam's the one from New Orleans. And by the way, Adam, uh, you are the second, you look so young, but you're the second longest tenured player on this Jester's team. When did you start playing when you were 10 years old? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I started playing in 2009. Um, this was my first season going into college. It was that summer, and um, this is my 10th season. That's kind of wild. And, and obviously, you've been over here. I've seen your footage because I went to a couple of games last year. This is your fourth season. How did you pick to come to New Orleans or you recruited over here? It was kind of strange how it happened, actually. I actually got in, injured in my uh, English season, and I needed to stay fit over the summer. So uh, I ended up getting in contact with Kenny, and it's just kind of rolled on ever since. And that's how it happened? Yeah. That's kind of funny. We'll stay with you because your dad, obviously, uh, for people that live in England, they know who he is. He's a well-known announcer now, but he was a great player. His name's Paul uh, Welsh, Walsh. So t tell me about him. Um, yeah, he, was, he actually made his debut in professional football at 16, um, which is quite young for, for a lot of footballers. Um, played for Liverpool, Tottenham, Man City. So some big names in there. So Liverpool, Tottenham, and Man 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 when you say Man City, Manchester? Manchester City, Manchester yeah. City. Now, what's the difference between Manchester City and Manchester United? One's blue, one's red. Um, <laughs> but they're the both, rival, they're, the they're rivalry both, is huge, huge. It's a huge rivalry? Yeah. Um, and talk about you. How did you get into soccer? Because, I mean, New Orleans, obviously, is a burgeoning soccer community. But, I mean, when I was growing up, it was it was getting get big. But by the time, I guess, you went to high school, it was already large. Yeah, it was pretty large. I mean, it was getting there. Um, a lot of people started watching the game, you know, with the World Cup coming up, you know, every year, get more and more popular. The United States started doing a little bit better in the World Cup, you know, and um, I think it kind of took off from there. But when I was young, I played football and soccer. Nice. I threw down my helmet one day, five years old, and I said, I don't want to play anymore. And I just continued with soccer. Um, my that, parents are gr from Greece, so it's kind of... So at five years old? Yeah. You said no more football? No more football. So you're going to play the football with the U in it? <laughs> yeah. yeah <laughs> and it's exactly. been the same. You didn't, you didn't even bother kicking for the Rumble, though? Uh, I had to. Um, I had to step in, actually, for, as a sophomore in high school because both of our kickers got injured. And y'all had a powerhouse squad back then, didn't yeah. you? Yeah. All right, all right. Now, more about you growing up, obviously, with your dad being in, in your blood. I mean, did you have a ball, you know, kicking around since you were, like, one or two years old? Yeah, I mean, pitchers I've got for it from this high of me with a ball at my feet. So I've, I've always been around it. And even though I didn't actually get to see my dad play professionally, I was always sort of like, when he went into, they call it Masters Football, which is sort of ex-retired players that play in, yeah, yeah, in, right, a, in right, an arena. Yeah, yeah sure. And uh, I've always grown up watching him play there. So uh, Well, talk about your relationship with your dad. Because, I mean, listen, I, mean, it's, I can't imagine growing up with a, a dad that's a legend. I mean, what, what was it like? I mean, I guess you might have been a little young, but there he is more recently, but we have also some shots of him playing mm. back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, what were stories you heard about him? Um, he was a very aggressive player, scored a lot of <laughs> goals. Um, yeah, overall, just uh, he was loved by the fans, from what I know, um, and he, done, he had a really good career. What's he doing now exactly? I, I know he's broadcasting, announcing, but what is it exactly? Yeah, so he does in-vision reports, so when a goal scored at a stadium, 
they go over to him and he does a quick commentary for 30 seconds on it. And uh, then it goes back to the studio. Sometimes he's, he's in the studio as well. Well, it looks like he's still got it going on at 56. Yeah. Hey, by the way, uh, let's talk about your Jester's team. Last year, you obviously made the city very proud. You guys were undefeated. And I went to the playoff game where you beat Atlanta. Anytime a New Orleans team beats Atlanta, it's a good thing in this city. And we loved it. Uh, but And this year, you're still having another good season. I mean, you're 3-1-1. One, and one. Uh, you're going to Knoxville tomorrow night on Wednesday, and then you have another game against the Georgia Revolution on the road in Atlanta on Friday. Uh, but talk about the season so far. I'm going to start with you, Adam. So we went into, uh, you know, at home. We played Knoxville Force, gave them a 4-0 spanking. And then, uh, <laughs> I mean, it is, in this league, it's tough to, you know, beat teams. Four goals, yeah, yeah. I mean, any, any soccer league. Very difficult in a, sure. any league. And then, um, you know, we had a loss at home against Greenville, but then we bounced back away. In, you know, in any league, in any sport, away games are very difficult. Sure. But we pulled it together, got a win in Nashville, 3-1, and then we tied it. Chattanooga, who have won and been in the final of the NPSL. I mean, listen, 3-1-1 one one is a great record. I mean, yeah. see, no, 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 no shame in that. I mean, listen, going towards the playoffs, where are we in the season right now with you guys? I think we're in an extremely strong position. I can't see us dropping many more points at all, if any. Um, but we have got Massive games coming up with Atlanta, with Chattanooga at home, which is always a great game to be at. Um, they're tough games, but we've got a brilliant squad, and I think. Well, we got a shot of you right here well. getting a goal right here, but uh, kind of go through this play if you remember. Like, are you set up for this? Are you? Or is no, this like you just, know this assist is coming? I did not know that was coming. Oh, I just had to. I've sort of made a 20 yard run and just latched onto it. <laughs> and then you and just uh, saw it pop up. You yeah, say, I got this just, one right here. Those are the nice and easy ones. Um, <laughs> exactly. So, uh, yeah. Well, all right. Now, what, what's the next home game? Because I want to get some people out in the stands for you. So when do y'all play home again? Is it Atlanta? Do we have Atlanta? Is that Wednesday? next Wednesday? Yeah, next Atlanta Wednesday. on Wednesday. So you got yeah. two road games. Now, the road is tough. I mean, the last year, I said you were unbeaten, but you had four ties or draws, you call them. Mm. And they were all on the road. So why is it? Because we all know, you know, that home court and in basketball is obviously a huge advantage. Football, you get, it's, it's obviously big. In soccer, I mean, why is it such a big difference? And I'll start with you on the home road. Well, first of all, you're traveling. You know, you, you might be traveling five, six, seven, eight hours. You have to mentally prepare, get your body ready for the next day. You know, it's a um, tough thing to do. You're playing in front of one, 2,000 fans that are away. Your fans aren't there supporting you. So we really have to bring it together as a group and take those points away from the other team. Yeah, and I'm assuming, unlike the Pelicans who have their own plane and they take but three-fourths of the seats out so those seven-footers can just put their legs out long, I doubt y'all are traveling in that first-class style. So how do you get to your games in these leagues? Uh, we have seven-seaters that take us there. I mean, they've, they've got a decent amount of space, but um, it's, you, not, it's not ideal. Are we talking about uh, on, the, on the ground, though, not planes, right? Not planes, no. <laughs> so, you're, so you're driving, after, right after this show, in fact, you're driving to Knoxville for the game. Mm -hmm. so, and that's a, that's a haul. I mean, that's not, that's not a short trip. I've driven there for a Tennessee yeah. game. Um, how, what does that do to your body? Yeah, I mean, you have to be ready. I mean, you have to, your legs get tight, your calves get tight. You have to take a jog after you get off the bus, stretch, make sure your hips are okay, your hamstrings prevent injury. Well, take me through game day then. So you get, you're going to get there tonight. Um, you know, tomorrow, what, what, do you, what do you start? The game's at night. So what do you do during the entire day to get your body ready for action tomorrow night? Try and get myself in the pool as soon as I get to the hotel tonight. Get a good night's sleep. So you said try to get yourself in the pool, right? Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to figure that out. Sorry. Right. Yeah, try and get myself in the swimming pool uh -huh. um, the night before a game just to loosen up because obviously after a, a long uh -huh. journey, it's just get, get everything going again. Uh, morning, get a good breakfast on board, try and get a nap for a couple of hours and then start mentally preparing for the game. Well, tell us about your coach, Kenny Farrell. Start with you since you've been with him for now 10 years. Yeah. 10 years. I mean, he's done a great job. I mean, we've had seasons where you know, in the past, you know, maybe win four or five games. But recently, he's really created, you know, a core group of locals and, you know, like Tony Judis, myself, um, some other places like Mr. Chase Mr. Jester, Russian. Tony Judis, right? Mr. Jester, Tony Judis. Well, you're That's Mr. Right. Jester Jr. He's only been there a year, year longer than you. One year behind him. That's right. it. And then uh, Chase Rushing, another young talent. He's really brought together these, um, you know, th this core group of locals and the core group of, you know, uh, foreigners and international players that keep coming back for more. Give them, gives them an opportunity, gives us an opportunity to really make a, you know, 
get us to the next level. Yeah, what I think is very interesting, he's got 11 foreigners. I, should, I don't want to say foreigners, but eight guys from England, three from other countries. So that's 11 of their 23 players. Um, has that always been the case? I mean, I mean or is this just something he's tried to do lately? I think it's slightly more this season than it was last season. Mm -hmm. um, but it keeps the competition healthy and it, it makes training a better standard with, with more players fighting for positions. And it's, yeah, I, th I think it's a good thing. It's a healthy really competition. Yeah, I do. Yeah. So what's the future hold for you? Like, wh wh what do you think your next step's going to be, Mason? Um, looking at my options in America, I've got options back home to keep playing back home. So I've got, I've got choices, but... I try and focus on this season before before I go into anything That's the only else. way to go. Yeah. What about yourself? I mean, you've been, you're still a young guy, even though you've been with this team 10 years. You started at 17. So what would be a dream scenario for you? A dream scenario for me would be a promotion relegation system in the United States. Um, really, you know, give the teams who, you know, earn the right when they win to get promoted. Right, 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 right. It's not a dead-end zone, you know? No, I know exactly. And I think most people don't know what you're talking about, but... In, in the rest of the world, unlike the NBA, the NFL, and our major sports, if you are at the bottom of the league, you get relegated to a lower league, and you move up. The only reason I knew this because I was an agent, and I had a lot of basketball players play overseas, and if they were in the lower division and they finished top one or two, they would get promoted into the top division, and vice versa if you lose. So uh, that is the thing I've heard a little bit lately. And do you think America will ever come to it? Since you're from England, you, you're, you grew up with that. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think it's got to happen eventually to keep the sport going forward. For um, soccer or for just soccer, every sport? For soccer, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know any different because every sport back home is promotion and relegation. So, uh, so what would be the next level from the M MLS? down to the next level, which that would be what you're talking about, relegate, yeah. and do it, do it all the way down to each league, to the lower leagues as well? And yeah. And go it, up gives, to the, okay. it gives the smaller teams, like, I mean, I don't know if you've heard of Bournemouth in the EPL. They, they were in League Two, they were nearly going bankrupt, and now they're in the Premier League. And they, they're a tiny, tiny stadium, it only holds 12,000. Speaking of Premier League, since I'm running out of time, I have to ask you a question. Uh, when Leicester won two years ago, Describe how crazy that is. Right now, the Las Vegas Knights are an expansion team in the Stanley Cup Finals, and that's nuts. But I don't think it even compares to what Leicester was. Tell people what that was really like, because this team had guys making like $40 a game yeah. or something. So what was that like when they won, the, the uh, obviously, the English League, Premier League? It's surreal, because you actually find yourself supporting them, and you don't, you don't actually really support them, but because it, you want to see them do so well because it's a smaller team than your Manchester United, your Manchester Cities. It's just nice to see a bit of a change rather than the usual four fighting for that first place. I mean, it was crazy, wasn't it? Yeah, incredible. I mean, it just doesn't happen. It, absolutely incredible. All right, I'm glad I got somebody that's actually from England to say it, but it's been a pleasure, Adam. Good luck with the rest of the games this week. Next week, don't forget, Thank and you. appreciate you, Mason. Here's a gift certificate. You live on Oak Street, so you're only like four <laughs> blocks away from this restaurant. Shays de la Chais on Maple Uptown. Thank you very much. Right Thank off you. of Carrollton Avenue in between Broadway and Carrollton. But the thing is, good luck the rest of the way. Next week, I want to let everybody know, Wednesday night, Pan, Mar Pan, Mar Pan American Stadium, I'm assuming. Pan Am Stadium. Get out to that game. Support this team. They are a lot of fun. They're getting into their stretch run, and they need your support. So check them out, the New Orleans Gestures. Hey, speaking of professional New Orleans teams, I told you this was going to be a different kind of show. We're going to have the NOLA Gold Rugby team, and they're fighting for a playoff spot as well. They're coming up next right here on Primetime Sports. Welcome back to Primetime Sports, and we're switching from a round spherical ball to a little bit more oblong and oval, and it's not football. It's called rugby, and like I told you before, we had the pro soccer team, the Jesters, a second ago, and now we're going to the new rugby league team. Major League Rugby has a new league, and the New or NOLA Gold team is in that league, and these teams are spread out all over the country. You have Seattle, Colorado, San Diego, and a regional rival, which the 
which the Gold have beaten twice over here in the Battle of the Bayou, they call it. In the Houston Sabercats, they've beaten them twice this season. And this team has two more games, and I'm trying to get you to come out because they play at 4 o'clock this Saturday over at Shaw High School. When I say Shaw High School, it's a brand new stadium they've got over there, and they call it the Swamp. So they got to get that game. If they can win that one, and then the game against Utah, the Salt Lake City team, this team should be in the playoffs in their first year, and that would be quite an accomplishment. And here are two players. Remember we had the general manager and the coach, Nate Osborne was the coach, and Ryan Fitzgerald, the general manager, a few months ago. Well, now we've got a couple of the players. Matt Houston, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Hey, how are you And doing? you play flanker, which is a little bit different than the flanker we have in football. Yes. And we have and your position, by the way, is is holding younger. Yeah, scrum? Scrum? Scrum half. Scrum half. All right, let's yeah. start there. What the heck's a scrum half? <laughs> So I gave my name. So obviously there's this thing called a scrum in rugby. Sure. It's a way to restart the, bu restart the play. Um, makes it equal contest for the ball. Um, and I'm, I technically, I just put the ball in. So they gave me the name scrum half. Scrum half. Yeah. I love it. Now what does a flanker do? Flanker is attached to the side of these scrums. Um, they kind of have uh, open range. So think of a linebacker, outside linebacker type guy. You're all over the place. You're doing all the dirty work, making the tackles carries, whatever needs to be done, you're the dirty man. All right, Matt, you're from Charlotte. Obviously, we won't hold this against you because you're a Panther fan. I get oh, yeah. that. You're from, you got to be from somewhere Panther and you got to root for your team. I get it. And you've had some good success. And you are from California, Northern California, Petaluma, yeah. which is right outside San Francisco. Let's start with you. How did you get into rugby? Because it, is this a sport that certain areas play at birth or did you, did you go from football to this? Well, everywhere else in the world plays it at birth except our country. Um, hopefully that's changing here in the next couple of years uh, coming up uh, with it getting into high schools and, and uh, the grade school system. But I started when I was 18 years old. I played uh, wrestling, football, three captain, athlete, everything. Um, but I found myself playing this game my senior year, and uh, actually the first game I played, I got ejected out of it for getting a red card. <laughs> so I loved it. You so, loved it. You <laughs> so, like physicality. Exactly. I mean, wrestling, football, and what's the other sport? Uh, lacrosse. Oh, lacrosse. So, yeah, that, that can get physical. Yeah, it can. It can. Uh, but uh, no, I just fell in love with it. It took everything that I'm good at, the aggression with wrestling, basketball growing up, soccer growing up, and it puts it all into one. That's why, you know, when the money comes and what this pro league is, the American athletes are going to be really good at it. I mean, it's pretty exciting, isn't it? I mean, listen, because I love to see sports like this that are, that, that are on the up and then they're on the come. This is the first year. What's it like being with an expansion team, an expansion league in its first year? And, you know, what do you think the future holds? Well, for me, it's unbelievable. I'm, I graduated from college this last, uh, last May. Uh -huh. um, so about a full year out of college. And I never, I never dreamed I'd be playing professional rugby when I'm, I'm 24 years old right now. Uh -huh. So I never dreamed I'd be playing for a professional side, or let alone traveling the world, um, coming down here all the way from California. So. I, see the, I see the scrum half right there. Look at there him go. go. That's you with the, the man bun, That's right? That's me. Nice. I got Looking the man good. bun, yeah. So uh, tell me your background playing and where did you get started? I mean, did you play football as yeah, well? So I played soccer. Mm -hmm. um, my dad would actually never let me play football. He, he played rugby, my uncle played rugby, so there's a little bit of blood in there. But um, I, was, I grew up playing soccer, and then I made the transition to rugby because, you know, I like just no, the I'm, versatility I'm fascinated of it, by this you know? because it's two different sports that y'all both came from. And I had asked the coaches this, is it more like soccer, meaning like the coach of Nate Osborne, your coach from Australia, mm -hmm. when he was on, I said, is it more like soccer and more like football? And he said, well... It's kind of like neither, but he, said, yeah, but he said, you know, but it is similar, I guess. That's yeah, why I wanted similar. to ask you guys who play, what do most of the guys on the team, what is their background? And how many, I know you have a lot of foreign guys yeah. too, so a lot of them may have grown up playing it, right? So uh, with this team, at this level, we have a lot of foreigners. Um, they, they know the game. Um, we're, as a country, still learning it. And, and it's just like in all sports, muscle memories, knowing what to do at certain times. That's what makes other countries still have an edge over us. Just they're, they've gone through it. They've, you know, they breathe it. They see it when they're little, young, cheering for it on TV, you know, just how we would know the rules of basketball more than they would. So that's an obstruction on it. But uh, a lot of the guys who are from America, their base is your football. Um, basketball players are really good. Um, good hand, eye hand coordination, good feet. Um, finding, and a lot of things with soccer and basketball is finding space 
So in football, a lot of guys are kind of you know running north and south, yeah. which we we need that in rugby. But this game is uh, about manipulating space on the field. So it's such a large space with only a few kind of guys. We're looking for space and angles, and so you can get these tactician type players more like a guy like this instead of a big meathead like me or, or something <laughs> like that. He might you know outsmart me and, and use the rules of the game to get around me. That's very interesting, and that you actually described that pretty well. Now I want your opinion for someone that's never seen the game. Just describe in like a minute or less what rugby is about. So I'd say. To me, rugby is the sport, it's the perfect contest. There's a contest in every bit of play, whether it's the tackle, because then once you make a tackle, there's a contest for the ball on the ground. Um, whether it's a restart of play, so a scrum, there's a contest in the scrum. If the ball gets kicked into touch, which we call out of bounds, um, the throw in or a line out, there's a contest in the line out. And so it's just, it's about doing that, and obviously it's a, about scoring tries and, you know, you know, having fun out there and actually, you know, playing with playing with your mates and sure, yeah. yeah and every, like the, all the rules based around the game are for kind of like if you think of it like soccer for the flow of the game. Football, you're having a coach run in plays every eight seconds. They say you have a play that goes off. In rugby, you're the coach's job's done when the when the game starts. So he prepares us for the game and then now it's a, it's a chess match with us just with brute force pretty much what we're trying to do so we're trying to now run a play but then off that play be setting up more plays and we're trying to outthink them and outpace the other team okay so let, here's an example you're you're bigger guy than but you're not small by any means but in football you know the smaller guys are probably cornerbacks or wide receivers maybe an occasional quick running back uh, is, is rugby like that? Does everybody have to be big, or do you have some guys that need to have some speed in this game? No, there's definitely there's a huge variation. You could have a guy that could be, he could be 300 pounds and, you know, like seven feet tall, and there's right. a space for him. And then you could have a guy, you know, that might be, he might be 5'5 five, five and 150 pounds, but he might be Very faster, yeah. smarter, better looking, you know, <laughs> whatever it is. That's obviously the quicker guy, right? <laughs> so, hey, real quick, the... Uh, the sport we just had was soccer, and they told me 11 of their 23 guys were foreigners. What is the ratio of foreigners on the NOLA Gold, and, and, and what, what countries? Give me some examples of some countries that they're so from. So I think we have a strong base of 35 players. We play rugby, this rugby union is what we play, and it's 15 versus 15 on the field. So we have a training base of about 30 to 35. I would say... Um, not counting like American passports, just um, you know their history. There's probably a good thirty to forty percent, you would think. Yeah, I'd say about thirty percent. Now, you guys played club hot rugby before, I'm assuming, maybe college. Is this level of rugby? Can you tell the difference? It's definitely higher. It's definitely much higher. Okay, here's the yeah. thing: we have a couple shots because I didn't understand. I watched the game a couple weeks ago. I didn't understand everything. I have seen some rugby, so I knew the scrum and all that when everybody's down there getting their thing going on. But what's this deal? I'm going to show you a couple pictures. When you're holding the guys up in the air like this. What does this mean? Yeah, so, so that's the lineup. That's how we restart play. If uh, It's like a throwing in soccer. Uh -huh. um, so that's how you restart play if the ball goes into touch. That's pretty cool. All right, the next one, and this might not be anything. This yeah. could be just team unity. What are people doing? Why are you all holding each other's jerseys here? What's yeah, this so rugby is a... Uh, it's a, this is one of the reasons why it's such an addictive game and why it attracts you and pulls you in for life because it's really a brotherhood game. Right. Like I said, the coach can't do anything for you. When you're on the field, it's like a battle, and, and he's the only guy I can lean on, right? And so those little, those little things of walking off the field before the game starts as one, you know, we're all in it together. I have his back. He has mine. Um, and that's really what makes a successful team um, successful. Um, the culture of a team, the individuals that come in, um, how you hold yourself, well, you know, you're accountable to your actions and, and you're going to work hard for your mate. And I'm going to say this, you're right, because I, I, the little exposure I've had to rugby, the brotherhood seems to be stronger in this sport than others. I've seen. And I, listen, I played a lot of sports and we were very close. But you, do, you guys do seem a little bit closer. One last thing before I let you go. I want you to explain to people why it's fun to go to a rugby match, which is coming up this Saturday, like I said, 4 o'clock. So try to get on out there. Let people know why it's so big and why to come. Well, I'd say 
If you come out to the game, it's going to be one of the most exciting sports atmospheres you'll be at. We got a band out there. Every single person that's out there is smiling, having fun. They'll tell you the game if you don't know, if you don't understand the rules and you need to learn a little bit of something. The guy next to you, the woman next to you, they'll happily explain and talk your ear off for the next hour and a half while the game's going. You've sold me. I'm coming. I'm yeah. coming this week. Hey, Matt Houston, Holton Younger, I appreciate you both. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much us. for coming. Us. And we learned a little bit more. Here's a gift certificate to Shays Della Thank Shays. You. Yeah, it's you. on Maple Street between Carrollton and Broadway. Hey, appreciate dude. you guys very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Hey, check that game out. Come on. To support our local professional teams. Hey, next week. You're going to get to support the soccer team. That's going to be next Wednesday. But this weekend, how about going over to the West Bank, over to Shaw, and checking out the NOLA Gold. They need the support to get to the playoffs. Hey, by the way, coming up next, hey, it's been a while since I've waited this long to talk either Saints or Pelicans, but we're going to do that now. We're also going to talk about LeBron in the NBA Finals. All that's coming up next right here on Primetime Sports. The owners of the Delachaise Wine Bar on St. Charles Avenue have opened up their newest creation uptown on Maple Street called Chez Delachaise, a new local wine bistro featuring a larger menu of small and large plates, a brighter atmosphere, and full table service. Additionally, patrons can enjoy a large patio out front as well as an extensive wine list offering selections from around the world. It's Chez Delachaise, 7708 Maple Street between Carrollton and Broadway. Rock and roll will never die. It's old New Orleans, my oh my. Come on, baby, let's go rock and roll at the city lane. All night, let's roll, let's rock and roll. Baby, do the rock and roll. At the city lane, the home of rock and roll. Hey, welcome back to Primetime Sports. This has been the most unique show. I've already had four guests and two sports I don't talk about a lot, but I got to thank my, my good friends from the NOLA Gold and, of course, the New Orleans Jesters. Hey, I have a special guest coming up next. His name is Frank Deus, Chief Medical Officer over at People's Health, but he's got a very unique story. So this, like I said, probably my most unique show in the 125-plus I've done. But this segment, this is going to be kind of normal because we're going to talk some Saints. We're going to talk some Pelicans. We might even get into some LSU baseball, hopefully. And we're certainly going to talk about what's going on right now, and that's the NBA Finals. Game two is in the books. Uh, Golden State pretty much had their way, particularly in the second half with the Cleveland Cavaliers. But that game one was special. Uh, Cleveland could have tasted victory. They had a bad call go against them. If you ask them, they'll say about 20 bad calls went against them. But Golden State did what they had to do and got that victory. And now they're up 2-0 going back to Cleveland tomorrow night. For game three, most people say if they're going to win one, that should be the one. But my guest has been here before. His name is Rod Walker from The Advocate. Welcome back, my friend. Thanks for having me back. And I've seen you at, at Saints practice the last couple times. Uh, you've been there. But let's start with the NBA Finals. We'll get into the Saints in a second. Uh, your take, let's go through the playoffs real quick because Golden State, most people thought Houston might give them a test, and they did. They went seven. But the fact is you pretty much knew Golden State was going, going to get in. Cleveland, even though they've been there three straight years uh, before this year to the finals, I think most people thought this might not be the year they get in, but thanks to a depleted Celtics team, which obviously missing two of their best players, particularly Kyrie Irving. Uh, but did you think that Cleveland's route to get here uh, was something that you expected? Well, I thought, um, you know, going to the playoffs, I just felt like this team has LeBron, and until somebody beats him, I, I just like their chances of getting it all the time. And, you know, he pretty much put that team on his shoulders in the, in the first three rounds of the playoffs and, and got them here and got it done on, um, you know, game seven against the Celtics there, and, and now here we are. He's done exactly what you thought because, listen, I, I told people I'll never count LeBron out. People say, oh, Golden State's going to sweep him, and they might still. I, I, Team, I think, at least I'm hoping that Cleveland gets a win or two. I really would like to see the series go a little bit. But when you have LeBron on your team, as evidenced by game one, where, where, where Golden State was a 13-point favorite at home, and Cleveland literally led almost the entire game. I mean, they really did. They led most of the way. And I'm not talking about beating the spread. They were winning the game, and they looked like they were the better team, particularly LeBron, who had 51 points. But... We all know what happened at the end, but do you think this team, tell me your, your opinion of that first game, first of all. 
Well, I think um, going into the series, I thought that for Cleveland to have a chance, I thought they really needed to try to steal game one because, you know, Golden State had just come off of that game seven against Houston two nights before, and you know, Cleveland had played three nights before. And I just felt like they needed to steal that one, and they did everything they could possibly do and just didn't come away with the win. And I think that's why you saw how LeBron was after the game. He looked really, really discouraged. Oh, my I think goodness. He knows well, he we did. have a bunch of faces of LeBron. Here we go, because and this is all from pretty much game one. You're going to see LeBron – was a lesson in frustration. This man scored 51 points, did everything he possibly could. He's averaging basically almost, a, he's averaging a triple double right now in the finals, but basically throughout the playoffs, he's pretty much doing the same thing. But a lot of these faces might have occurred, uh, certainly when there's a foul call there, because he, he, he couldn't believe some of these calls. But the biggest face he saved was when J.R. Smith got the rebound. And by the way, that was a great rebound because he kind of swiped it away from Kevin Durant with four and a half seconds. George Hill could have put the team ahead with a made free throw. He misses, and then your boy right here gets the ball, and he decides to dribble out, and you see because he thinks they have the lead. He can tell you he thought it was tied, but we all know he thought he had the lead. Um, LeBron got a little frustrated after that. Yeah, I think when you look at that play, I just think Cleveland just as a whole, they just weren't prepared to get that offensive rebound. It looked like they were just shocked to even get the offensive rebound and just – they weren't aware of the situation, obviously, and um, it came back to haunt them. And that they, that could be the pivotal game in this series. You know, if this series is one to one now. I mean, we're really talking about you know how Cleveland has a shot at at winning this thing going back home. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, listen. I mean, that is as pivotal as it gets. I mean, listen, like kind of like the hockey play when the guy put the stick out in game two. Caps might not be up 3-1 right now if that happens. And this is this was similar in the sense that if that happens, we could have a tie series. But the biggest emotion, and I don't have this video with me, but most people saw it yesterday, was when LeBron was on the sideline during the timeout. They didn't even talk. Not one word was said amongst the whole team in the timeout going into overtime. So they're tied, and he found out when Ty Lue finally came over that they had a timeout, and he put his head down, just, and they checked out completely. I'm talking when you're going in overtime, and I play basketball, and you have coaches telling you exactly what you need to do, whether it be five minutes in the pros or three minutes like we had back in the day. Um, there's no talk. They almost like decided this game's over. We have no chance. And I think you saw the results of that once, once we got into overtime. I mean, Golden State just pulled away, and Cleveland, they pretty much threw in the tile after they didn't win it in regulation. And I think a lot of people watching the game thought that may happen anyway. You thought, okay, this is, they didn't get them in regulation. You think Golden State's going to. Uh, pull ahead now. And, and, and they almost covered that 13. They lost by 10, <laughs> but it was up to like 12 at one point. I've got to ask you that you see some testy nerves in this series. Um, do, can, can Cleveland get a win out of this? I think they can. You know, we saw Cleveland go through the same thing in the, in the Boston series. They lost the first two games on the road. And yeah, a they lot did. Of people, a lot of people wrote Cleveland off at that point, but, you know, all you have to do is come back home and take care of business, and I think Cleveland will get game three. I think game four is going to be the key. You know, they got to if they can tie it up and go back to Golden State, they can they tie it up. It'll be very interesting. It'll be tough to get both. Golden State is a good road team, but you know what? When you got LeBron at home, they have won eight consecutive games at home. But then again, the Celtics had won ten in a row at home until Cleveland knocked them out in Game Seven. Let's switch over to the Pelicans because they're near and dear to hearts, and they got even dearer after this particular season. I thought it was special uh, towards the end of the year. They got on that great roll after they swept Portland, boy. You had a run right there. They had they were actually 32 and 14 at that point since January 10th. What are you seeing for the future of this club uh, going into next season? I think the one the main thing going into the se into the off season, we have to remember that as good as the season was, as good as the postseason was with them sweeping Portland, you know they were still right there on the edge of not making the playoffs. No so, doubt. So this off season is critical to um, to the future of this franchise and. Um, you know, obviously it all starts with DeMarcus Cousins. You have to decide what you're going to do with him, and I think that's a big decision that Dale Dempse has to make, especially with him coming off of his Achilles injury. Um, well, so, what, would, what would Rod Walker do? I mean, what would Rod well, – obviously the easy solution was to give him a two-year contract to prove it, but there's teams out there that are going to offer him max or close to it, which means the years and the security. In the NBA, you get paid regardless – if that Achilles doesn't heal, you're going to get your money, and you know he's looking for security. What if the other team offers him that max deal? Would you do the same? I think it's hard to do, especially with how well the Pelicans played without him. I think, you, you know, if, if that happens, I mean, I think you probably go in a different direction and, and try to add some pieces and, and go without him. But, I mean, it's a really, really tough decision um, with that injury. I mean, it just changes everything, especially with the 
specific injury that it is. I mean, it's tough, yeah, because that is the hardest one to come back from. Even the knee injuries, which used to be career injuries, they have, you know, they, they've come so far in medicine to, to clear that up. Um, as far as free agency, if, if let's just say if they didn't go Boogie's way, would you, since they have a four technically in, in Nico Meritich, and you can see that he actually can play better defense than you thought he could? Because normally you have a Ryan Anderson, he can't play D, so you have to have another four. But since they have a good four, would you spend some of that money on a three maybe? Like a... Because they're, they're, they're small forward position. They're going with a guard, basically. Right. Etwan Moore's been playing. And who knows how good Solomon Hill is going to come back because he didn't look very good at the end of the season. He needs to get back in shape. But where would you spend that money if it was there? I think a three is what you need. I mean, I think you need a solid guy who can come in and, and you know, defend on the wing and everything. And I think that's, that's probably the direction I think they go in. That's very interesting. Well, well that's going to all come up. July 1st is when it begins. I think you can start actually signing them a week later. But, yeah, you can make commitments before that. So we'll know in the next month. Hey, uh, let's switch over to the Saints because, uh, you know, practice last week, they, you don't get access to every single player. It just depends. Sometimes the locker room is more full than others. Uh, when I was there, it wasn't all that full. But we did get to talk to some of the great uh, guys and great players. Marshawn Lattimore. Uh, who I was very impressed with in this interview there. I took that picture, actually. This kid, and I, I put this on Facebook, um, I think besides Cam Jordan on this team, uh, that's the only other guy that I think you could say has an argument right now for being the best player in the NFL on his position. I think Cam Jordan is certainly an argument there, and I certainly think Marshawn Lattimore, even though he's a young guy only in his second year, I think he is that good. Yeah, you know, the thing that was impressive about talking, talking to him last week is, you know, he didn't let last year go to his head. I mean, he still feels like he's, quote, unquote, overlooked a little bit, and he thinks he has work to do, and he wants to prove himself. And that's a good thing to see out of a rookie coming off of a year like the one that he had last year. Yeah, and he was special. And if they can get some help on the other side, and I think Crawley's going to be fine. Also, you have uh, Patrick Robinson coming back off a Super Bowl victory. Coming back to New Orleans, that's going to be a very interesting battle between these guys. The, before I get to linebackers, I want to talk about them. Ben Watson's another one. I was very impressed with Ben's interview. He's still cut up like he's always been. He's the ageless wonder. And it was just great seeing Ben back in the Saints locker room. He had some serious stability to the locker room. And I can't understand how important that is, especially yeah. with Zach Streep going. Right. Ben Watson is a 37-year-old guy who actually led the Ravens in receptions last, last season, which, which says a lot for him. And, um, you know, with Kobe Fleener being gone now, I think he's a guy that Drew Brees will definitely uh, look to at that tight end position. And that's a position that, you know, Saints didn't do – you know, particularly well with it no, with tight no, end last terrible. year. So, so this and, is you know, Ben Watson's not going to put up Jimmy Graham numbers, but anything better than what Kobe Fleener was giving you for seven and a half million a year. That was kind of ridiculous. And Ben's going to be cheaper. And I feel better with him in the lineup. I really do. I feel I feel a little bit more secure, if that's a better word. All right, let's talk about the linebacking core because this really fascinates me. Linebacker for a few years here was kind of a dearth of talent, in my opinion. And last year you saw it pick up. They really, I thought, played pretty well. And I think Better things with Demario Davis coming in from the Jets. I really love the year he had last year there. You're going to probably start him at the middle linebacker, but what I love is Alex Anzalone's back. And, I mean, this guy who was kind of derided when he got drafted, he showed how athletic he really is. You put him in A.J. Klein, and then you got Craig Robertson still. you got Manti Teo still and Nate Stupar. I really love the linebacking core of the Saints have a have assembled. Oh, I agree with you. And I mean, this isn't Dome Patrol by any means. No. But, I mean, you really got some really solid guys who are interchangeable. And I think that's the big thing about this group is that you can interchange these guys. And Demario is a guy who's um, he's going to be a leader in that locker room. And the guy's going to really look up to him. And, you know, you talk about um, Alizon, he, um, his shoulders, we know he thinks it's better now. So all that plays a part in this. He's this a is, specimen. Yeah. And it's he's be a, a really specimen. And you heard his fellow rookie from last year, who's now a second year player, Marshawn Lattimore, was like, this guy is a freak. He's a freak of nature. I mean, that, he was picked in the third round for a reason. And he probably would have been picked higher had he not had the injury problems in, 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 in college. And hopefully, obviously, he was hurt last year. Hopefully, that's not a symptom of things to come. One last thing while I give you this gift certificate to Shays to LSJs. LSU baseball. Hey, listen, everybody talks about being a bad year. They lost so much talent. I mean, they lost the two best pitchers almost in their franchise history, or two of the best. And then they, they've lost position players everywhere. All the leadership is gone. In, in 20 seconds, what do you think? You know, I, you, you look at the regular season. I mean, they struggled, you know, in the SEC play, but then they got to the tournament and got hot when it mattered and ended up, you know, going out to Oregon State and played a team that was clearly better than they were. And, yeah. Uh, 
you know, we'll have to see what happens next year with that team. But yeah, I mean, they're going to be back. I mean, listen, they still got to the tournament. They still got to the finals in the SEC tournament. Nothing to sneeze at. Just like yourself, Rob Walker, always great to see you, and I appreciate whenever you come on the show. All right, enjoy Shades, Ellis Shades. Hey, got to thank him. Hey, don't forget, Frank Dayas is coming up next right here on Primetime Sports. We'll see you in a second. I hear the train a coming, it's rolling round the bend, and I ain't seen the sunshine since I don't know when. I'm stuck in Folsom Prison, and time keeps dragging on. But that train it keeps a rolling on down the sand and town. When I was just a baby, my mama told me. Hey, welcome back to Primetime Sports. I got to thank Rod Walker for coming, talking that Saints Pelicans NBA Finals. And of course, I want to thank the guys from the soccer Jesters team, of course, and also the Rugby Nola Gold team. Hey, but I'm going to close out on something different, something a little bit unique for the show. Uh, I have a good friend. They got leukemia several years ago. Right now, he is chief medical officer over at People's Health. Uh, he's a urologist by trade as a doctor. And listen, I've had lymphoma myself. I've had cancer myself. So when he presented this to me as far as, uh, you know, trying to let people know, be aware of leukemia, lymphoma, I wanted him to tell his story. And it's a very unique one. So here he is. His name is Dr. Frank Dayas. And here he is. Frank? Scott, welcome to Primetime Thank Sports. Thank you very you much doing? for having me. This Absolutely. This is a very non-traditional uh, role for someone to be on your show. I'm honored to be in this chair where famous people like Archie <laughs> Manning and Drew Brees. <laughs> They've have, all been sitting sat. there, man. But yeah. hey, hey, you're famous in your own right in the medical community. And listen, this was probably about 16 or so years ago that That's you got right. leukemia. Yeah. And it, it, obviously, you're a survivor. I mean, you're truly a survivor. Some forms are a little bit more dangerous, for lack of a better word, than others. Mm -hmm. But you were at a point where you didn't know whether you were going to live or not. So why don't you just go ahead and just tell us your story? Yes, I'm, I'm actually very honored also to be nominated for the Man of the Year contest by the Louisiana-Mississippi Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, yep. which is a contest that ends in just seven days from now. It essentially is a fundraiser, but I'm much more vested in this personally because of my story. Uh -huh. When I was in the peak of my surgical urology practice at the age of 41, over a very short period of time, I was diagnosed with acute leukemia. My doctors told me the day after I was diagnosed that your chance of living past the next seven to nine weeks is 25%. Wow. That was really devastating wow. for me. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, listen, when you have a diagnosis like that, because I, I, everything I've gotten, it's like, oh, 90% chance of survival, 95. When you hear 25%, that's got to hit you at your core. What is your first thought, Frank? My first thought was the when, when I was given this news, I was actually in the operating room doing lithotripsy, which is a very sophisticated video game to take care of kidney stones. And I got the call from my PCP where I had gone back to work thinking it would make me feel better after this rapid decline over two weeks. And he said, Frank, it looks like you have leukemia. Oh, my goodness. And I, I said, Jay, hold on. I'll call you back after this case. <laughs> I called him back and he said, I've talked to your oncologist. You need to go in the hospital right now. Your orders are written. Go and get yourself in the hospital. And I said, Jay, I, I can't do that. I have got to go home and I've got to see my son before I go in the hospital. Because I really he didn't. He was a baby at the time, He was right? seven months old. Right, wow. Seven months old. His, his name is Jackson. There he and is. And he's, he's 16 now. Adorable. And so I went home and I set up a video camera that I had gotten to... Uh, for his birth to make him a videotape to try to explain to him who I was and why I had left him. And then the next day I went in the hospital where I was there for what was to be a very arduous course of eight rounds of chemotherapy over My two goodness. years. My goodness, Frank. Which included uh, multi-organ system failure, septic shock a couple of times, uh, being on a ventilator in the ICU for eight days and 66 units of blood and platelets transfused. So I'm here to advocate for blood cancer research. Yeah, tell people what this, is, what this graph means right here. So in leukemia, uh, the survival rate is still way too low. 
too many people still die from acute leukemia. We've made a lot of progress in the other areas of leukemia and lymphoma, but acute leukemia, the survival in five years is still only 25%. Wow. So we need to do a lot more research. Blood cancer research leads the way. There are many, many firsts in blood cancer research. It was the first chemotherapy treatment, first combo chemotherapy, first activated T killer cells, first activation of uh, other parts of the immune system, first bone marrow and stem cell transplants, et cetera, et cetera. We, you know, if you think about uh, Brian Piccolo from Brian's song. Great movie. Right. That was the only movie that made us cry when we were little boys, right? That love story. At least that we'd admit to. <laughs> Other side of the mountain. <laughs> so the, the story of Brian Piccolo and, and his good friend Gail Sayers focused on Brian Piccolo's diagnosis of testicular cancer. He died at the age of 26 in 1970. Had we been today where, where Brian Piccolo would have been diagnosed today, He'd he almost alive. certainly would have yes. been cured. Yes, he would. And the same thing is probably true for most cancers. We just have to unlock the secrets to how to treat these, these different cancers. And that's very interesting you say that because 1980, even 10 years after that movie, it was still a death sentence. And then literally 20 years later in 2000, I'm very familiar with this because I had it, it became almost an instant survival rate. So how do, what can be done to make leukemia have the success rate or the rapid improvement that has happened for testicular cancers and other cancers as well? It's, it's research, research, research. Right now there's an international master trial occurring in acute leukemia, which is being supported by Leukemia Lymphoma Society. That's where most of the money that I'm raising funds for will go. Th this this uh, graphic here shows that AML, which is what I had, acute myelogenous leukemia, still sits at the bottom of the five-year survival curve. Although it's been moved, the red arrows depict the movement of the survival rates just in the past five or so years. But there's a long way to go, particularly for AML. So what did, what did, what did uh, Craig Sager, my good friend I used to work with, he had some form of leukemia. You may not even know, <laughs> but I mean, there was times that he looked like he was going to live, and then he went. He had a rapid decline right afterward. And and this is another good example of someone in the sports world that had leukemia. A little, maybe a different form, maybe the same form. I don't even know. But so he is one of the unlucky ones. That's that's right. Uh, there are too many unlucky ones still. I was fortunate because the type of leukemia that I had, the type of AML, was the very first one to be identified by the specific gene mutation that occurred, in my case, a spontaneous gene mutation, that caused this type of cancer. Uh, we, can, we can apply this knowledge to all the leukemias. You know, when the, when the human genome was finished being mapped in about 2000 or 2001, we unlocked a lot of secrets. Now we just have to start classifying those secrets into what treatments work, what activates the immune system against what type of bad cells or malignant cells and saves the good ones. The Leukemia Lymphoma Society does such good work. I mean, honestly, what, what can people do that are watching that they, if they have the resources to help, what can they do to help this cause? And, and is there a website they can go to? How does it work? Right. I have my own website. It's called frankbeatleukemia.com, my full story. And uh, several pictures are there. And it explains a little bit more about what we've talked about today, about why I'm motivated to this and what my personal... Yeah, uh, everything that people donate goes straight to research, right? I mean, it goes to research and it goes to patient advocacy. Some of the money stays very local and it is used for patient assistance and advocacy. And I have to tell you, that's so important because if I would have not been a physician and had to go through the decision-making processes that had to happen in order for me to choose the right treatments or, or to agree with the treatments that were chosen for me, I don't know if I could have done that not having a medical education and the ability to read the literature for myself and to confirm that. So forming these local networks is very important for survival. I have a very dear friend right now whose daughter is going through this and, and the, the support and the inspiration that he gains from having the associations with people who have been through it before, particularly in the medical community like myself, is, is really important. Well, I'm telling you, you look fantastic. Uh, and, and one last push to this, please, if you, have, if you are able to donate to this cause, this is a very worthy one. 
and one that we want to get behind as well. Uh, tell me more people about the Leukemia Lymphoma Society before I let you go. Yeah, the, the contest, the fundraiser contest, ends on June 14th at 6 o'clock. So if you are inspired to donate, please go to frankbeatleukemia.com and you can donate there or to any candidate for Man, Woman of the Year for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Any donation's great, but we're rooting for Frank. Okay, so All let's right. do this one. Frank, I appreciate you. Hey, we got a great restaurant here for you. I'll mm -hmm. give you that one instead of that one. Uh, and that is called Chase de la Chase, part of the de la Chase family. All right. Right there. Chase de la Chase. Yeah, you go. Thank right you there very on much. Uh, Maple Street between Calton and Broadway. That, my man, is Frank Deus, and he is a living miracle. We are so fired up for you, my All man. Right. All right. Thank you. Got to thank everybody here. Got to thank all the guests. I had six total guests today. That might be a record. And, uh, well, I had some bands, too. Uh, but anyway, I want to thank everybody. Will Hill, my producer, who does such a fabulous job. By the way, next week, Garrett Temple, the former LSU Final Four player, who now still plays with the Sacramento Kings, the only player still playing out of Big Baby and Tyrus Thomas. Who would have thunk it? He's going to come on. And, uh, and also coming up the following week, a guy that played right after Billy Cannon. He was a Heisman Trophy runner-up. Jerry Stovall, the former LSU star, also coached the Tigers in the early 80s. He's going to come on as well. Hey, got to thank everybody from CST and WLE, Anthony, Redhead Tsunami, Naila, everybody else. Thank you very much. We'll see you next week. It's going to be spectacular. Bye.